Now, Dr. Kenneth Hansen, welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. You are a uh, researcher of uh, Hebrew and Judaic studies, um, and of course the Jewish religion being the oldest religion in the world um, has a connection to a lot of other things in, in the world and uh, certainly worth uh, researching that stuff and looking into that history to get an understanding of our ancient past and all that. And uh, so it's great to have someone like you on the show who can talk about that. And uh, and good uh, to be with you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, uh, this is, uh, I haven't been able to do a lot of shows uh, recently, had a lot going on in my life. And, uh, but it's great to be doing one now. And uh, just a just quick disclaimer to all my listeners and all that. Um, after the first 40 minutes of this uh, show, or you know, I'm going to have to pay me to listen to the rest of it. I have subscribed to Patreon to be able to listen to the uh, interviews in their entirety. Last interview I did with Dave Champion, I made free for everybody, but that was only because I hadn't done a show in a little while. So uh, this one and all the ones onward will probably be um, pay-per-view for the last um, uh, 30 to 40 percent of the uh of the program. But without further ado, Ken Hansen, uh, please introduce yourself. Um, you've been on a lot of uh, radio show programs in the History Channel and such. And uh, so, yeah, you've been around uh, and tell us what you've seen, what you've experienced. Well, and, I'm, uh, I'm the coordinator of the University of Central Florida, Orlando Judaic Studies program, a coordinator and endowed professor. Uh, so I head up everything Jewish. We teach everything Jewish from ancient times all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and on through the ancient biblical period and across thousands of years. We don't just stop with the Bible. We trace all of Jewish history across millennia uh, all the way through the modern period. We have an entire course devoted to the history of the Holocaust and also we teach the rise of modern Israel, not to forget the Hebrew language. So uh, we have a lot going on and a, a number of fine professors, including three rabbis in our local Orlando area. We are the second largest university in the United States, by the way, a lot of people don't realize that, but we are huge and booming. So we have a lot of uh, students who, who are potentially interested in our courses. We call from a very large student body. Uh, I'm also the author of a number of books. My latest, and I do have to advertise this, my publisher will like it, it's called Whose Holy Land? Archaeology Meets Geopolitics in Today's Middle East. And yes, there is a connection between archaeology and the land of Israel today and the conflicts going on in the land of Israel today. And so I give a nutshell view of archaeology, current archaeology, past archaeology, and what it all means and how it all pertains. Um, it's exciting stuff. Uh, I first became interested in all of this uh, as a young student at the University of Illinois, uh, Chicago, uh, in a pre-law curriculum at the time, when it dawned on me, you know, it could be the world has enough lawyers. So what do I do then with a pre-law degree in history? And I just decided to let my intellectual curiosity carry the day and drag me off to the Middle East. So while I was still a senior in college, I hopped on an eastbound plane for Jerusalem, Israel, and plunked myself down in the midst of that entire culture that I had never experienced before. I did not know the language at the time, but I threw myself into it, started studying Hebrew, and in Israel, they don't mess around. They make you fluent in the course of a single year uh, from zero to fluency in the language. And that opened the door to the study of these ancient texts, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, which became the, the focus of my research, of much of my research in any case. Thank you. And uh, since you mentioned those Dead Sea Scrolls, we might as well uh, discuss them um, in much greater detail right now um this may be preaching to the choir to a lot of people because it seems like a uh, dead sea scrolls video is always uh popping up on youtube um on an everyday basis there's never uh enough to um to talk about with those things um 
So, but for those who aren't familiar, why don't you uh, tell the story of uh, where what the Dead Sea Scrolls are, where they were found, who found them, um, and what they reveal, and is there actually um, uh, stuff that hasn't been uh, revealed regarding the Dead Sea Scrolls, or have they all been um, translated or tried to be translated, and uh, what stories do they tell? Why don't we get really deep into this? A yeah. bunch of questions there, and it never hurts to do a good recap of the whole story behind the scrolls. We got to go back to the mid 20th century, actually the year 1948. The location is the Great Jordan River Rift Valley, it stretches all the way from Lake Victoria in Africa to the foothills of Mount Hermon in northern Galilee. At its lowest spot, it is in fact the lowest place on Earth. It's more than 1,200 feet below sea level, below the level of the Mediterranean. And in that exact location, we find a lake of saline sulfurous brine, seven to 10 times saltier than ocean water. Nothing lives in that lake. And so it's aptly called dead, the Dead Sea. Well, it's also the geographic boundary between the state of Israel today and the Kingdom of Jordan. Um, back in those days, 1948, we encounter a young Bedouin shepherd lad by the name of Muhammad Adadib, who, along with a compatriot of his, was tending a flock of goats along the western shore of the Dead Sea. And when you just think of the topography, it's, it's a moonscape. It's utterly parched and barren and desolate. It rains not a handful of times in any given year. In that kind of brutal environment, there's not a lot out there except a few desert shrubs and bushes and a few flocks of sheep and goats who feed on, on that sparse vegetation. Well, our, our friend Mohammed is, is tending his flock of goats one sp spring or summer afternoon, we're not exactly sure when, in 1948, when he discovers that one of his animals has gone missing from the rest. And he's, he's terribly uh, excited, anxious, I should say, and starts poking his head into every nook and cranny up and down the western shore of the Dead Sea. Where is my goat? He finds nothing. No, no goat, no animal. Uh, after a time, he starts hurling stones into the entrance of a series of lonely desert caves that pockmark the chalky marl cliffs on the western shore of the Dead Sea. Cave after cave, they're up there in this chalky marl composite. And he starts hurling stones into the cave entrances, imagining, well, maybe my, my goat has gone astray into one of them, and surely the stone will, will frighten the animal out into the open, but still no goat. After he lets loose one nice big stone, his ears are pricked by a very curious sound. It sounds like something deep inside that cave is, is breaking or cracking open. It sounds like breaking pottery. And curiosity peaked, young Mohammed hauls himself halfway up the side of the cliff and squeezes through the very narrow cave entrance and peers into the darkness. And sure enough, leaning up against the inner recesses of that cave, he sees a whole row of earthenware pottery jars, clay vessels, barely visible in the dim light. His stone had struck one of them. And that was the sound he heard. Now, it, uh, of course, he's hoping he's found something valuable. Maybe there's buried treasure in these clay vessels. He starts prying the lids off one after another after another. And there's nothing, nothing in there. Except when he pries the lid off of one particular clay jar, his eyes are met by a, a very curious sight, a, a big, oddly wrapped bundle of something rolled up, doesn't know what it is. He hauls it out of that clay jar, hightails it back to his Bedouin campsite, forgetting all about his missing goat. And there that night by the fire, he and his friends unroll a series of parchments. 
ancient Hebrew parchments covered with some kind of a language. It's ancient Hebrew, but they don't understand it. Their native tongue is Arabic. They don't have any idea what they found. So they just they just roll up their curiosities again and stuff them into a big old burlap sack and leave them dangling from a tent pole. And that's the beginning of the saga of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's, it's, it's incredible, it's amazing. I like to tell people you could not make this up, but that's what happened. For weeks thereafter, the Dead Sea Scrolls accompanied the Bedouin as they made their way back and forth across the wilderness or the desert of Judea. They think after a while that there might be some value attached to these leathery type of parchments. So they make their way to a little town in Judea called Bethlehem. Bethlehem of Judea, where they proceed to find a, a little Arab shopkeeper and part-time cobbler. His name is Kondo. He goes by the nickname Kondo. And they, they approach this fellow in his shop in Bethlehem and sell him several of these parchments and bid him adieu. Kondo now looks at the parchments and he can't read them either. He doesn't know what he's discovered. He thinks well, it is a leathery sort of material. Maybe I could cut them into strips for use in the repair of sandals. He was also a part-time cobbler, but he thought better of it. And uh, in, in the end, it, he gathered some friends and cronies and they went back to those caves where the Bedouin said they had found this stuff and, and they uncovered even more materials. Several of them, Kondo took up to the city of Jerusalem and sold four of them to an archbishop in the old city of Jerusalem, and neither he nor the archbishop knew what they had bought. The archbishop couldn't read them either, but they turned out to be biblical parchments and non-biblical parchments, and that in the end is what the Dead Sea Scrolls contain. We've got the oldest copies of the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, called also the Old Testament, known to exist in the world. Up until this time, the oldest biblical copies were medieval. They dated to around 980 of the Common Era. And now all of a sudden, we've got biblical manuscripts, including the complete book of the prophet Isaiah, 66 chapters long, completed entire that predate the previous oldest texts of the Hebrew Bible, not by a century or two, but a thousand years older. These date from the first two centuries before the Common Era, BCE, as we say in, in academe. But there's more in, in addition to biblical books, and we have at least fragments from each and every book of the Hebrew Bible, the only exception being the book of Esther. It's the only one we don't have. We've got the complete book of Isaiah and at least fragments of all of the others, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, on and on, all the prophets, etc. But in addition to all of that, we've got hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts and fragments of manuscripts of texts that were unknown to the world until 1947. Nobody even knew they existed including, for example, a complete book of Psalms. This is not the biblical book of Psalms. It's a book of Psalms that never made it into our Bibles. Nobody ever saw it before, knew it existed until then. So it's a treasure trove of ancient texts, documents. It's a whole library that dates from the days of, of course, King Herod the Great and the Romans and some other characters folks may have heard of, of named um, John the Baptist and uh, Jesus of Nazareth. It's exactly from that period of time and it, it opens a window on this ancient Jewish culture that we never had before. That's it in a nutshell. Fascinating story indeed. So uh, let's uh, switch gears to another uh, prominent uh, artifact from biblical times that uh, does it exist? Does it not exist? And if it 
does exist where there are many forms of them. I'm talking about the Ark of the Covenant. Um, now, uh, is the scene that we see in um, right Indiana Jones, right? Is the Lost Ark an accurate description of what the Ark can actually do? I mean, uh, a lot of movie makers, um, they know the name of the tune. Their movies are truth under the guise of fiction. And, um, well, uh, another thing about the... Um, Ark of the Covenant, uh, where is it located? Um, I've heard everything from the uh, hole on Oak Island to um, some temple in Ethiopia. Uh, so um, why is it that there's, um, oh, we can't seem to uh, believe that there's one set location? And uh, I mean, if you know anything about this, um, why don't you tell us, uh, if you know anything about this, the Ethiopian um, location, what is it about that place that causes people to think that it's located there, um, in particular the people that live in that area? And um, if you know anything about the Oak Island thing, what reason to believe is there that the Ark of the Covenant could possibly be in that um, in that hole that every time people try to dig deeper, it always seems to fill with water? So... Um, why don't you tell us the backstory of the Ark well, of the Covenant? I just happen to have a facsimile of the Ark of the Covenant right here. Yes. Which is more or less what it may have looked like. But the interesting thing is that this facsimile wasn't designed to be the Ark of the Covenant. This is actually a facsimile of an ancient Egyptian funerary chest such as found in King Tut's tomb and other tombs in ancient Egypt, uh, covered in gold with the winged Isis atop. And yet people looked at it and think, well, oh, this is the Ark of the Covenant. Well, the Ark of the Covenant looks remarkably like an ancient Egyptian chest. And why is that important? Well, because being an academic, uh, I can report that there's a lot of skepticism out there in the academic world. Scholars are trained to be skeptics. You can't go through grad school without becoming a skeptic if you weren't one already. So what's the proof that there ever was an Ark of the Covenant? What's the proof that there ever was a Moses? What's the proof that there was an Exodus? What's the proof that Israelites were ever in Egypt to begin with? Do we have uh, an, any archeological evidence? No. So you're just weaving a bunch of stories. We have Passover coming up, incidentally. That's the commemoration of the Exodus from Egypt. So what? You got a, a story about Israelites in large numbers being driven uh, to slavery and then coming out of Egypt with the Ark of the Covenant. Well, actually, this, I can tell you as a scholar, is some of the most important evidence we have th that Israelites were, in fact, in Egypt at one time. And if you, if you believe there was an exodus, all you got to do is look at this. And, and why? Because if, as the skeptics suggest uh, the stories were put down many centuries later and they just projected that once upon a time we were slaves in Egypt and came out in a great exodus under a fellow named Moses but none of that is true none of that ever ever existed but if this had been written down centuries and centuries later when the storytellers fabricated out of whole cloth this this box that they called the ark of the covenant well, how did they know that it would look like, that it would resemble an actual funerary chest from ancient Egypt? How would they know what furniture in Egypt ever looked like? They wouldn't know. They would have constructed something that was completely foreign to what ancient Egypt actually produced, and yet they didn't. The covenant box, which is what the Ark is, was fashioned in a way that Egyptians would have understood, that Israelites in Egypt would have understood. And this is some of the strongest evidence we have. Now, 
what became of the Ark of the Covenant? We're, we're told that the Israelites brought it with them out of Egypt. Now, we can't prove that, but we just look at the telltale shreds of evidence, such as I just shared, and say there is nothing in the account that suggests it didn't happen. And we do, in fact, have texts, and we even have Dead Sea Scrolls that claim that it happened. That's not proof, but it's a strong narrative tradition. Okay, they come out of Egypt across the Red Sea or the Reed Sea, as it were, and they make their way toward the land of promise, ancient Canaan, the land of milk and honey, and they're carrying that covenant box. That's what it was. The covenant was the most important concept of all to the ancient Israelites. And what was contained inside that covenant box, but the tables of the law, the Ten Commandments, and Aaron's rod that budded and a jar of manna that they were eating in their wilderness journey. And wherever they carried the ark into battle, they were victorious. And that's the tradition, at least, that we have. The Israelites could not be defeated as long as they carried the ark into battle in front of them until some disreputable priests were shepherding the Israelites into battle. And as a divine punishment, they were defeated. The ark was captured, taken into captivity, as it were, by the Philistines, and it brought plagues upon the Philistines wherever it went. So much so that the Philistines finally threw up their hands and sent it back to the Israelites um, <laughs> on, on a wagon. So th that's the story that we have. We, we also have uh, other biblical stories that uh, if, if you carried the ark in the wrong way, you'd be struck dead, that sort of thing. Um, but that's the tradition. Uh, certainly, you didn't look inside of the ark, and you had to be very careful what you did with it, or yes, you could be stricken dead by the Almighty. Now, what became of it? Where did the ark finally end up? And that is a mystery. We don't really know. Uh, we're told that it ends up in the, the great temple built in the ancient Israelite period, the Temple of Solomon. I have a facsimile of the ancient temple as well. So um, the, the temple was divided into an outer court and, and then an, an inner chamber. But then the most holy chamber in the very rear of the temple was called the Kodesh HaKodeshim, or the Holy of Holies, separated by a curtain. And the only thing in there was the Ark of the Covenant. That's where it resided, so we're told in the biblical text. However, what happened to the temple? Solomon's great temple was destroyed by the Babylonians who came in and burnt the city of Jerusalem to the ground in the year 586 before the Common Era, BCE. Temple was burned, the city was destroyed. What happened to the Ark? Uh, we're, we're told that the Babylonians took the furnishings of the temple, all the wonderful gold furnishings. There was a menorah inside the temple, for example and uh, a table of showbread. The Babylonians took all the, the fine furniture captive with them back to Babylonia. There's no mention of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, a couple of possibilities. Maybe in the, the days of King Solomon, the, the Ark found its way down to the land of Sheba, because we're told that Solomon was visited by the Queen of Sheba. And there are all kinds of stories about the, uh, the king of Ethiopia called Menelik. And, and maybe it was brought down uh, to, to Aksum in Ethiopia and it has been held there inside, inside a church. Of course, no one has seen it and uh, no one is allowed to look at it, so they say. 
And being an academic skeptic, I'm skeptical of this story, to be honest. Uh, something like that, you could not keep under wraps for all of these uh, centuries, indeed millennia. Uh, so, and, and as far as the location of Sheba, I don't think it was in Ethiopia at all. Uh, I, I think it was in Yemen, Yemen, and that's, a, that's another story. Um, but in any case, uh, th there's one other possibility that the Ark of the Covenant was brought down underground before the Babylonian conquest, before the Babylonians invaded. They literally sank the Ark into chambers underground, and there it stayed for safety. Which brings us up to the 20th century and my, my book again, because there was actually a famous uh, rabbi, uh, Rabbi Getz of Israel, who when the city of Jerusalem was reconquered by the modern Israelis, he started digging tunnels underneath the Temple Mount. And he claimed actually to have located the Ark of the Covenant, and even seen it with his own eyes until a, a fight broke out with the Arabs and it, it was literally fisticuffs and the rabbi retreated hastily and the state of Israel said, you better seal up that entrance that you made to the underground caverns because we don't want, we don't want a major war erupting over the uh, Ark of the Covenant, assuming it's there. Uh, so that's what happened. The, the gate has been sealed and no one can go into those subterranean tunnels. That's a second possibility. And a third possibility is most intriguing because we have a non-biblical book called the Book of Second Maccabees. It's one of those books that never made it into our Bibles. It's, it's uh, from the apocryphal Bible. But this book relates a story that Right before the Babylonians came in and destroyed the temple, burnt everything down, the prophet Jeremiah, the great prophet Jeremiah, took the Ark of the Covenant and the tent, uh, whatever that means, uh, presumably in, including other furniture from the, the Holy of Holies, and brought it out into the desert and hid it in a cave, which he sealed. And no one knows the location of that cave to this day, except it will be revealed in the end of days before the Messiah comes, before the Messianic age. Wow. So that gives us a number of possibilities, doesn't it? And all of them intriguing. Absolutely. Um uh, what I want to ask you next. Um, all right. Uh, there's a uh, thing here I see on your uh, Treasures in Time website. I'll make sure I cite that when I um, uh, upload this um, so people can access your uh, your work and everything. Um, interesting uh, thing here, Kosher Jesus. Um, I clicked on that and I saw a few things. Uh, there's a bunch of... Um, audio recordings, are they videos, um, talking about, uh, Christ, um, well, uh, did he actually exist? You've heard all this stuff about how, um, the story of, uh, Jesus is nothing more than a, um, metaphor for the astrological path of the, of the sun, but I've also heard that, uh, there was a, uh, Jesus, he was a solar being, but his story has been twisted. That's not me talking, that's Akashic Records reader Andrew Bartz is talking, who I frequently cite as a source on this program, because I believe that his Akashic Record at reading abilities are perhaps the best way to answer almost any question under the sun. So if he says that the Akashic Records say, and if they say it, then well, <laughs> it must be true, unless he misspeaks or something. <laughs> so, um, I mean, if he says that there was a Jesus who was a solar being and his story has been twisted, well, then I guess maybe there is some truth to that. But um, that does, um, <clears throat> does raise the question, um, well, then uh, does that mean that the, uh, uh, the astrological story um, of the sun across the um, the, uh, the, uh, the sky is a uh, 
is really not a twisted story at all. I mean, that's real. That's um, that's what astrology um is. That's how uh, and um, as above, so below. So if it happens up there, it's got to happen down here. So is it really shouldn't come as too much of a shock that there would be some being, a solar being, who was a representation of what happens above. But um, I don't even know if I know the meaning of the word kosher. I've heard it so many times in my life. Uh, it has something fit, to do with it. Fit or suitable. Yes. Okay. Fair means fit or suitable. How come it has ties to the, um, seems to have ties to the Jewish faith? Well, what's well, up with that? Fit or suitable for Judaism, for Jewish consumption. So Jesus is often thought of as obviously the father of Christianity, but certainly not some something or a, a faith that's fit or suitable for Judaism, right? Jews do not believe in Jesus, obviously. Uh, so how do we approach Jesus? Was there a kosher Jesus, a, a Jesus who was in fact not only Jewish, but absolutely fit and suitable within the Judaism of his day? So what we do is we distinguish between the, the Judaism of religion, the Judaism of mythology, and what we're looking for as, or who we're looking for as the historical Jesus. Was there a real person in history known as Yeshua Minatzeret, Jesus of Nazareth. And there are plenty of folks out there, including some scholars who think that that Jesus himself is entirely an invention. There, there never was a historical Jesus. This is all a myth, just invented. Uh, and as a scholar of Judaism, I have to take issue with that because I think that there was in fact a historical Jesus, a Jewish Jesus, and beyond that, that what he taught wasn't any different from what Jews of his day and age were talking about, including those who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. He lived at the same time period. And when we look at his actual teachings, if we can trust the, the Gospels as, as records of what he taught, really, 90% of everything that came out of his mouth was already being taught by Jews of that day and age. And that's where we have to really dig into to Judaism. What is Judaism about? And it, in a nutshell, it's not a religion of belief. It's, it's not about what you believe. It certainly isn't hell insurance where you're going when you die. No, it's, it's a faith of practice. It's a faith of behavior. And what do those initial books of the scriptures discuss? The Torah, as we call it, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the books of Moses. It's about behavior. It's, it lists the commandments. This is how we're to live as Jews. And if we take care of how we live in the here and now, then Hashem, God, will take care of everything else, including our eternal destination and, and where the soul goes. Now, there are all different avenues to which one can proceed in Judaism. Most of it is down to earth. Kosher today mostly refers to what you eat. I think it was Seinfeld who said uh, Judaism is, is uh, it's, it's not a way of living, it's a way of eating. And uh, you can almost think in those terms because a lot of what the Hebrew Bible talks about is what we consume, what we don't consume. We don't consume uh, shellfish, for example or, or um, animals who are carnivorous. We don't eat dogs and cats. We, we, we eat the, the, um, the, the sheep and cows and the, the, the sheep of the field, as it were. And, and we don't mix milk and meat and all sorts of laws as to what we can eat and what we can't. And all of this is, is kosher. It, 
it, it focuses us with every meal that we have on being Jewish, on being obedient to the commandments. And we don't even think about why we do it. We just do it and everything else takes care of itself. But as I said, there are other avenues you can go down. One of them is mystical Judaism. And that has been around since ancient times and is still around today. It's called Kabbalah or Kabbalah. And there's been a lot of interest in Kabbalah in recent years. After all, Madonna is, has been all involved in, in Kabbalah, even as a non-Jewish woman. It's Jewish mysticism. Madonna became sort of an honorary Jew, uh, delving into to the, the secret notions, concepts of divinity and the various emanations of the divine that course into the material world and how we relate to God through those emanations of, for example, mercy and compassion balanced on the other hand by stringency and severity. And the mystical idea is that the two actually go together and must be in balance. If you have all compassion and kindness without the severity, you're missing something. And certainly if you have all severity without compassion, you're in trouble. But both must be present. Both must emanate from the divine source into our world. And we're a part of that in what's called the repair of the world. Now, the question then becomes, was Jesus a Kabbalist? Was Jesus also a mystic? And that's a little bit debatable. Um, certainly mystical ideas evolved and uh, many were revealed long after Jesus walked the earth. It's, it's an evolving thing that people become more and more enlightened in the mystical ways over the centuries. And the, the greatest flowering of this mysticism was actually in medieval Spain. And, and then it spread to the land of Israel from there. So uh, was Jesus a mystic? I, I think there, there were some uh, mystical aspects to his teaching. Uh, when he, for example, addressed God as my father. In, in Judaism, you don't do that. We say Avinu, which is our father. But to say Avi, my father, it, it, it's a sort of a mystical union between us and the divine, between Jesus and the divine. You can call that a bit of Kabbalah in antiquity. Uh, but so much more needs to be done, so much more needs to be uncovered as to exactly how close Jesus' connection was to the ancient mystics. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned the um, Kabbalah. That's the uh, tree of life, is that right? Yes, or, uh, there's, uh, it's yes. called Etz Chaim, the tree of life. Um, and, and these emanations can be depicted, in fact, as a tree with various various branches. The, the highest branch is, or, or the crown, we should say, not even a branch, it's the crown up on top, is called the Ein Sof, uh, which means without end. It is unknowable. Uh, God on that level cannot be known or apprehended. And so we must appropriate the knowledge of God through the emanations, which branch out on either side. One side is mercy and compassion and various emanations connected with that. The Hebrew word for mercy being chesed, loving kindness or compassion, chesed. And on the other hand, it's these emanations of severity and including uh, din, which means judgment, and gvora, which means power. And th these are all connected that as a professor, I mean, I can't be too cushy <laughs> in how I relate to my students, right? I have to, to balance my chesed, my compassion, and my kindness with a little bit of deen, judgment, and gvora, which also means power, which means strength, 
we're not strong as individuals un unless we have a bit of, of this emanation of, of severity. Thank now, you, thank you. Uh, I wanted to mention actually one other artifact. No problem. That, that uh, is being considered of late, afresh, it's another parchment or series of parchments, another scroll, we can call it. 16 strips of parchments were discovered in a cave somewhere in Transjordan in the mid 19th century, the 1860s, thereabout, by Bedouin. Now, the story sounds a bit like the Dead Sea Scrolls found in the 20th century by Bedouin, but these particular parchments found a full century earlier. They were found wrapped in a, a, a kind of linen cloth here, and then we have pieces of leather inside. 16 of them in all. And of course, I have good facsimiles here. The Bedouin sold them to a shopkeeper in Jerusalem named Moses Shapira, who looked at these and discovered that these are in Paleo Hebrew, not even the Hebrew that we read today. This is the a much earlier form of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, I had to learn the Paleo-Hebrew alphabet. I, I speak and read modern Hebrew, and I speak and read Dead Sea Scroll material also, but this is, this is even earlier. And by the style of the letters, this would date to between 800 and 900 BCE, hundreds and hundreds of years older than even the Dead Sea Scrolls are. But the Dead Sea Scrolls had not yet been discovered, and nobody knew what these were. The shopkeeper in, in uh, Jerusalem, Moses Shapira, he, he, he looked at them, and, and he didn't know how to read this Paleo-Hebrew, and he realized he was looking at an abbreviated version of the Book of Deuteronomy. And he was blown away. He had never seen anything like it. A shorter version of the Book of Deuteronomy. Now, I mentioned that a lot of scholars today doubt that Moses even existed. They doubt that Moses wrote our traditional book of Deuteronomy because there's a lot in the book of Deuteronomy and the other books of Moses that don't look as though Moses would have written them. Why? Because they contain a lot of laws and regulations that have to do with the people who were settled farming regulations, for example. One famous law, later quoted by Paul, the apostle, says, don't muzzle your ox as it treads out the grain. Well, the Israelites are stuck wandering in the desert for 40 years. What ox? What grain? This makes no sense. Moses could not have written such a thing. In fact, the end of our traditional book of Deuteronomy even describes Moses' death. <laughs> How could Moses have written about his own death? Deuteronomy is a pious fraud, so many scholars have claimed for decades. Well, when we look at this text, none of the problematic passages are there. The ox treading out the grain, it's not there. Uh, the death of Moses is not described. If we could fabricate a text that the real Moses actually wrote, this would be it. It's a shorter version of Deuteronomy and, and that probably underlay the, the book that came down to us, that was then expanded over centuries. Well, the shopkeeper was so amazed by all this, he went to Europe, showed it to other scholars. He went to London, where it was put on display in the British Museum amidst huge fanfare. The Prime Minister of Britain, William Gladstone actually came and looked at it. And Moses Shapira was undertaking negotiations to sell it to the British Museum of London for a 
sum of one million pounds sterling. And that was back in 1883. It would have been the most important biblical manuscript ever discovered. This is just one fragment. There are 16 like it. What happened, however? The other scholars he showed it to had never seen anything like this. There, there were no Dead Sea Scrolls. They looked at this and said, you know, must be a forgery. It was faked just so it could be sold for a large sum. And because, as I mentioned at the outset, scholars are skeptics. We're trained to be skeptics. And one scholar after another started dumping on this find and on Moses Shapiro. And the poor man was disgraced. The British Museum took the display down. Uh, um, Moses Shapiro himself fled to Holland, eventually to Rotterdam, where he put a pistol to his head and shot himself to death. What a story. In the meantime, the fragments themselves were put up for auction in an auction house in London. We're talking about the 1880s, sold for just 10 pounds sterling and they have subsequently vanished. And nobody knows what became of them. What we have today are hand transcriptions of this text that were made at the time, where some of the scholars who later condemned them as forgeries actually transcribed it all. So my facsimile is produced from those hand transcriptions. But having examined this text, I have no explanation for who could have forged it. Was it the shopkeeper, Moses Shapira? Well, within the last couple of years, an important scholar from University of Potsdam went back to Europe and found Shapira's own logs and journals where he is staring over this text, trying to make sense of it and understand what it means, making mistakes along the way. If he had forged this himself, why would he be trying to figure out what it means and making mistakes? It's impossible that he could have forged it. So as we speak, there is renewed interest in what we call the Moses scroll. There is renewed interest in it and serious scholarly work being done on this, again, with a lot of skepticism out there because that's what scholars do. I'm on the side of those who say this has to be authentic. There is no one who could have forged this. And consequently, this would be the most important biblical text ever found, including the Dead Sea Scrolls. Fascinating story indeed. Um, OK, so we'll go on for, I mean, for another 15 minutes. Um, at this point, uh, all listeners will have to pay me um, to listen to the rest of this um, interview. Um, Patreon, please, um, please do consider uh, subscribing. It's definitely worth it. I try to get valuable information on my shows out from the beginning to the end. But um, hey, it seems like uh, the end stuff always seems to be the most interesting. Um, there's exceptions to that. But anyhow, um, let's get into some stuff here that 